there's this metaphor we've been talking about. We call it the meadow and the ledge. I just want to quickly go over it again. It's the idea that religion, spirituality, traditions kind of have two groups, or maybe our experience is they have multiple spaces. One is this like, picture of a meadow, and the meadow is traditional spirituality, traditional religion. And it's beautiful. It's, it's like this amusement park. It's gorgeous. It's, the rides are wonderful, and everyone's having fun, and everyone's smiling, and it's wonderful. And like, it's just it's a magical place. It's Disney World for religion. But for some reason, and I've never figured this out, for some people, they look at that meadow, and it's just the place they want to be. And some of us look at that same thing and all we can see is the paint's peeling, the rides are a little rickety, grass isn't right. It just doesn't feel like home. I don't, yeah. Even as I say it, I can feel it in myself. Now, for those of you who've been part of Friend Church for a long time, you know this. But there's people here who this is very new, and they're going, what the? (laughs) I don't understand how this all works. So let me talk to them for a second. And I want you to remember this journey for you. It's that journey of looking at religion and spirituality and tradition and going, it's supposed to work for me. (laughs) It works for them. Why doesn't it work for me? We find ourselves just feeling more and more alienated. We describe it as this. There's a meadow and then there's this ledge. No, sorry, a cliff. And the cliff for us, when we're, when we're, we're kind of reacting to the meadow, it, it's this kind of this, this piece of going, well... If that's spirituality, if that's the Christian tradition, and I don't fit, that's my only option, isn't it? I gotta jump. Throw it all away. Give up. And some people do, yeah, they just take a header. I'm done with this shit. Pardon my French. <laughs> Some of us, it's a slower journey. It's kind of like, uh, maybe I can make the meadow. Oh, that's not working. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. Okay, maybe if I hang on the edge of the meadow and I keep my nose kind of over the edge, I can be like, hey, hi, you know, I'm not in there. Is that going to work? Some of us, it's a back and forth. It's, I come back. Oh, I get burned. Ooh, back out again. Back in. Some of us, it's hanging on a cliff going, well, I don't want to throw it all away But the meadow up there isn't working. I know that. I've gone back and forth enough times. So what do I do? Anyone, any climbers in the room? You know that feeling when you're on the edge of a cliff and you're really tired and you start getting a showing machine leg and you're like, your whole body's starting to shake because you can't hold on anymore? A lot of people, that's what their spirituality looks like. Don't put up your hand, but anyone resonate with that feeling of like, do I just... I don't know what to do. And we describe Friends Church as this space that's kind of, it's not the meadow, it's down the cliff a little ways, but there's this ledge, and we're all down there having a party going like, we're doing spirituality down here, it's awesome. Come on down and be like, screw you guys, (laughs) I can't let go. And we're going, uh, okay, we're just gonna have a little party down here, call us when you're ready. You know, they're one foot off the ground. He's like, just stretch down. You can make it. Anyone have that feeling of going, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm just like locked. I don't fit in the meadow. I don't want to throw it away. What 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 do I got? What are my options? Friend Church is kind of this space. A bunch of people who are on the same journey. All doing spirituality together. But it looks different than the meadow. (laughs) My coach, he's like, I don't like your whole metaphor. Take the meadow and we're down here. Flip it like this. Let's be on the top. Put them on the bottom. (laughs) I was like, oh yeah, I get it. The metaphor is designed to show you though something. 
If you've been part of Friend Church for a long time, you feel this in your bones. I don't need to say it. But for the new people here, what we're trying to show you is there's not just one way. Believing that the meadow is the way is just an idea. It's just a bunch of people who all agree, saying, hey, we're going to do it this way. That's what the meadow is. But it's not the only way. If, you're, if that's the first thing I say and you're going, whoa, 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 this message is for you. Because even as we look through our tradition, through the biblical record, <laughs> there is not just one way. We've been talking, so once we could, once you, if you're still hanging on the cliff, by the way, the rest of this message is going to be like, wah, wah, because you're still going like, how do I get back to the meadow? <laughs> I'm going to show you this ledge space where there's a whole bunch of people doing a whole bunch of different things, and it's beautiful, and it's wonderful, but it's not the meadow. It's not we all do the same things, we all agree in the same way, everything works the same for me as it does for you. It's not that space. To do this, you have to give that up. But what you get is incredible. So let me just paint a couple pictures of the meadow for you. In the meadow, we have this kind of consistency. People agree. And there's not just one meadow. People in the meadow think there's only one meadow, but there isn't. There's a bunch of different meadows. We call them denominations, and you know how many of those there are, right? All it is is a bunch of different meadow people looking at the other meadows going, okay, you're going to doing it wrong. In the old days, the first definition of the word atheism was a meadow that didn't agree with another meadow. You look at the other meadow and you're like, you're atheists. But what it is, is it's, it's this idea that says, what if we conceive of God as this entity, kind of like you and me, right? Like a being, but just make it super. Like take Vince, then you go to Superman, right? That's even like more powerful. Then just go like a million times higher than that. And you get this conception of, of a super being conception of God. Anyone know anyone in their life who holds a very super being conception of God? This is the most common. If you look at Homer Simpson, right? <laughs> they even draw God bigger. So you can be like, okay, super being, right? Not like Homer, super. And they don't put the face because that gets weird. And how exactly draws Jeff's or God's face gets tricky. Sistine Chapel. We have Adam, God. God's surrounded by all this stuff. God looks like an old man. When I say an old man in the sky, I'm referencing really beautiful art. But the art says something. It says we conceive, when we use the word God, what we think of, what's conceived in our heads, is a being up there. I just had someone today, another person swear in the space. I do it all the time. First thing we did is we both looked up, right? Because if God's a super being up there, and that super being is going to get mad if I swear in a temple, it's just a conception. And if you grew up in a meadow space where everyone held that conception, like I did, my meadow space, whew, God certainly didn't like when I swore and certainly didn't like it in a church. And I'm pretty sure when I'm preaching, saying swear words probably was really bad. Sorry. <laughs> what I'm trying to pull out of you is what you mean, what your conception is. Now, if you're from the meadow, you're going, Vince, why, why do you keep using the word conception? Stop using that word. It's God. I have God all figured out. It looks like an old man in the sky. But maybe that's just the meadow talking. What if we could just back ourselves off from that a little bit? Because the reality, even within this conception of God as a being that's super, we have a range. If you grew up in the New Testament era, so Christian tradition, chances are your super being is good. Good things come from the super being. Bad things come from someplace else. Devil, whatever. 
Anyone in my production team knows that anything goes bad in our system, we blame it on the devil, right? Amen, team? They're giving me the thumbs up in the back. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a literal sense. I mean that in a metaphoric sense. So your conception of the super being is God is good. Now, if you go earlier in our spiritual ancestors' records, the super being was both good and bad. This is a bit of like a... Good things come from God. Bad things come from God. You know, someone gets some food. Yay, God. Famine wipes everyone else. Yay, God. Well, that's not the meadow I like, is it? But what it says is this idea, this, this belief that we're not talking about conceptions of God. We're talking about God because we have it all figured out. That's what that metaphor is trying to poke at. Because even in our tradition, there's a range. Jeff talked about a wicked one a couple weeks ago. I think it's two weeks ago. So the super being is conceived of either, I'm going to use big words here, imminent, meaning close, right? That speeding ticket is imminent. It means it's very close to you. So the super being is imminent, meaning like God is here. Anyone kind of grow up with this idea of God is your friend, God is your like forever, God's in your heart? Imminent. If that's your meadow, that's where it came from. Transcendent is the word to say far away. Now the problem with imminence is you go, if there's a super being right here that's good, why is all this bad stuff going on? Like, why are people getting assaulted? Why are wars happening? So the, another big word, the way you deal with your conception of God and bad stuff happening in the world is called a theodicy. And one theodicy, the one that Jeff talked about, is theodicy of agency. It says, what if we conceive of our super being way, 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 way far away? And that super being is entrusting you, me and you to do the good in the world. The question then becomes, why is that person starving? Not because the super being didn't do anything or didn't care. It's because me and you didn't do anything. We didn't care. That meadow feels kind of a bit nicer, doesn't it? It's just another conception of God. Someone gave me some feedback after my last message. Fair feedback. I talked about the beingness of God being like localized versus everywhere. And they said, well, what about the Holy Spirit? Anyone grow up with this conception of a Holy Spirit? Yeah. The Holy Spirit, depending on your meadow, some of the traditions say the Holy Spirit's with you often. Some of the, times, the traditions are the Holy Spirit's always with you. Some of them are when you do the right things and you sing the right music in the right way, the Holy Spirit's here. Depends on your meadow. Can you see all the different conceptions? The one that's ringing my bell right now, and like ringing it hard, is the idea of non-localization. Super being is tied to this idea of a being that could be someplace. Right? I said God doing a flyby. If we set up a Nose Hill Park, if God could fly by, it'd be like, hey, God's here. Oh, God's gone. Oh, crap. We get these metaphors of, I don't feel close to God. Or I have to go to church, because that's where God lives. God lives here. Luckily, he doesn't live, you know, at my house where I do bad things. Localization. But what if, in our spiritual ancestors, some of them even say, this is the most orthodox conception of God. I don't know that I would argue it, but it's interesting. It says, what if we conceive of God as the divinity that makes up everything. Jesus says at one point, split a piece of wood. It's there. Move a rock. You just saw it. Divinity everywhere. That part of me that I don't like, what if I see that as divine? <laughs> My wife, God bless her soul, she's watching online. Hey, babe. Um, loves to use my words against me. So <laughs> when I'm angry at someone in traffic, she's like, hey, do you think divinity is in that person as well? <laughs> oh, I hate when you use my words against me. <laughs> 
So now we have this whole thing of like, no, definitely no divinity in that person. There's no way you cannot drive like that to be part of the divine. But don't you love it? People who know you can just like, yeah. But she's right. I'm acting like that is a bad person. Instead of going, no, no, no. What if I see the spark of the divine in them? Someone asked me, how do you do war? How do you conceive of God in this way and see war? I don't know the answer, but I'm pretty sure you can't see the divine in your enemy and treat them that way, can you? Or maybe you have to reject the divine in you. Anyone's growing up experience not prepare them to conceive of God that way? For me, I don't even use the word God for that because it, my brain wants to go to super being. That's how I grew up. That was my meadow. I use the word divine more than and it, within this, this kind of, the technical term is hyper-being, beyond being. It's saying the idea of a being, God, conceiving of God as this thing, is too limiting. That's why they say it's more orthodox. One of the, the biblical characters uses this conception of God. They say, when you love, so if I love you, the divine is the love between us. Not romantic love, but love. The divine isn't something that's intrinsic to you, intrinsic to me. The divine isn't something that up there is watching me going, okay, yeah, Vince, you did good. I like it. I like it. You're loving Kevin. Good. We're like it. No, no, no. The love itself is God. Do you see all these different conceptions? Now, up in the meadow, the answer is, well, which one's right? 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 <laughs> Anyone know that? Well, ours is right. Theirs is wrong for sure, right? And even you'll hear pastors like me, they won't say things like conceptions of God. No. In fact, in some traditions, stating your belief as much of a fact as you can do is a sign of your spiritual strength. So you don't say, my conception of God. You say, God is this. And you have to say it with a loud voice and yell. There's always like yelling with that one. It always creeps me out a bit, but whatever. It's that idea of like, God is this. If you do this, God will do that. Don't hit the mic fence. $100,000 piano. But you see now how that's just the meadow working at spirituality in their own way. Trying to go, wait, no, 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 there's not a range of conceptions. There's one. We just have to figure out the right one. A friend of mine, I was interacting with him on this message. He's from a, a different tradition, different meadow. Their church, this is going to sound weird to you, bear with me. Their church is debating whether or not women should be pastors. Women should be pastors. My answer is, sorry, what? Now, I grew up in the tradition, so I get it. But part of me goes, why in the world would you be, be debating that? Why in the world would you take approximately half the population who have incredible skill sets, who could do incredible things, and say, you can't do this job? Does my gender have anything to do with me doing this? But in their tradition, they're going, no, no, no. The right answer is God can't use somebody who has a female gender to inspire a community. I don't mean to be super judgy. That was a little bit of a judgy face. I apologize. <laughs> but I can't help it. <laughs> they're asking the question, how do we choose? And their question is, how do we choose the right one? Right? One thing about the meadow is, the meadow always says, we have the right one. 
Oh, you met Ors over there, you're atheist. You guys don't have it all. You're wrong. We have it figured out. We have the right one. I'm just going to go on the record and say, I don't think I have <laughs> the right one figured out. And I certainly don't think I have the right one figured out for all of you. But let me go there. The book that inspired this series was a book by Karen Armstrong called The Case for God. Can you throw it up for me, Francis? Wicked read, wicked read. Super boring, super dry, wicked read. <laughs> Sometimes people are like, hey, can you send me that book title? I would love to read that. Maybe watch a YouTube video on it. But if you're super into like following the evolution of the conception of God from our earliest records all the way through to today, wicked read. But she has this line in it. It's the line that demarcates the meadow from the ledge. It shows us why I can use the word conception of God. And it basically is the foundation of this whole series and this message. And it's this line. Can you throw it for me? Religion or spirituality isn't something we think. It's something we do. What if I say it this way? Your conception of God isn't something you think, it's something you do. Well, that sounds a little bit funny. I don't know about you, but growing up in the meadow, beautiful. Again, I, <laughs> I wish I could take the, which pill is it? The, the blue pill in the matrix where you can go back into the matrix. Whatever that one is, there's days when I wish I could do it and sit in the meadow and see what they see. My mom lived her whole life in the meadow. It brought her incredible comfort. I don't understand, but I would love it. I would love to be able to sit in a room and go, everybody agrees with me. We're all exactly the same. That feels like it'd be super fun, wouldn't it? One size fits all spirituality, and it fits everybody. And yet, that's a thinking place. We think God is this. I have it right. The earliest spiritual ancestors, they never talked about the thinking, the, the, the abstractness, the scientific proof of having this right. They used a different word. We'll talk about it in a second. Can I just take a digression? Why do you think the church got all hyped up in thinking about stuff? I got a thesis. I think it's the scientific revolution. Scientific revolution started kicking like some serious ass. They were like, we can solve diseases. We can like move huge amounts of effort. And the church is like, we sing songs. <laughs> and they're like, well, crap. <laughs> we look like chumps. So maybe we should go and like articulate our tradition through the language of science. Because that's what's valuable, right? So instead of having the religion class at the school, they went down to the physics class and they're like, okay, so we're valid because we're right. That is a very new phenomenon. If you read Alison Armstrong, or sorry, uh, Karen Armstrong's book, you will find that that is like 100 years old, maybe. For tens of thousands of years. Spirituality and religion was something you do. There's a, a writer, his name is Rob Bell, love his work. We've used this for years because it's so beautiful. He wasn't, he didn't articulate it like Karen Armstrong saying, religion is something you do. He said, no, no, no. Religion and this whole tradition is about something he calls bounce. Bounce. Yes, this is a crushed velvet safety thing. <laughs> I, was, I was told by the people that this was made in the 70s and it's original to the trampoline. <laughs> Bought it for 25 bucks. You see, here's what Rob Bell says we've been doing in the meadow for so long. He's like, this is what we're doing with our spirituality. Did we get the spring right? I think that spring's wrong. That's women being pastors. You can't have that spring. It's not the right spring. Okay, and what about this one over here? Is God transcendent or is God imminent? I don't know. 
but you have to get it right. Is the trampoline something you analyze? No. Rob Bell says, this is what a trampoline's for. If I do that too much, I'm going to puke. <laughs> I should have got somebody to do it for me so I could talk and they would bounce. Right? What does it feel like at the top of a bounce on a trampoline? Anyone know that feeling? Where you're weightless? And you just, yeah, wee -hee -hee -hee. There's something in the bouncing that's not the analysis of this. It's not the vector diagram of the spring rate of that thing. That's, that's the wrong questions. That's the questions of science. The, the experience of bouncing of like, oh, wow. This is me, but it doesn't feel like me. I feel different. The word is ecstasis. When something takes you to a profoundly spiritual place. The point of our spiritual journey is to do things that feel transcendent, feel otherworldly, connect us with something more, not to analyze whether we have the trampoline right. That said, you guys are all looking at the crushed velvet cover and wondering, what era was this? They told me it was 1970, so just so you know, I asked. It was made in 1970 before I was born. What is ecstasis for you? What is bounce? The other day, I was at a funeral for someone in our community. It was down at Elbow Falls. Small, small. Just the family, and they let me come, which was beautiful. And at one point, their wife dropped their ashes into the water. And I saw the ashes of the person I knew flow past me and go over Elbow Falls. And something ecstasis, I don't know. It was more than just standing on the edge of the elbow watching ashes flow by me. Something in my heart shifted. I was connected to my mom who's passed away. I was looking at my life from a different point of view going, what exactly are you doing with your life, Clausen? Have you given that a big thought or think through lately? I thought through the nature of those ashes as they flowed into all the water, to all the water of the world. And I felt the interconnectedness of every human being that's ever been to me in that moment. And I freaking bawled. And then I left them because I was feeling embarrassed and then I went and bawled on my own because I needed to bawl on my own. Ecstasis. Is that person there? Did that, my friend, did they actually flow down the water? I don't give a shit. That's the trampoline. The moment of watching her ashes flow by me changed everything. Bounce. You have all these different ways of conceiving of God. I could sit here for three hours and tell you new ones after new ones after new ones. How do you choose? What if we use that to choose? Could a woman in our community create ecstasis for us on a Sunday morning? Hells yes. I'm seeing two of them right now. Does your conception of God as a super being that has a plan for your life, that knows everything about your life, that knows every detail, that loves you deeply, does that create bounce? Great. Hold it. The idea of being the hands and feet of God in this world, of, of doing tangible things to change the world for the better, if that connects you to bounce, if that's ecstasis, great. You see, on the ledge... There's not one conception of God. There's thousands of us all on our own trampoline. Bouncing. And I look over yours every once in a while like, hey, can I come bounce on yours for a second? 
oh, that's sweet. I'm going to take some of your springs and put them on mine because that works for me. You see, in the meadow, the question is, what's the right trampoline? On the ledge, the question is, what trampoline works for you? Someone said to me after I, I talked about this, they were like, you mean I'm not all alone? I'm not doing my spiritual journey all alone? No. I'm jumping right beside you. My trampoline just looks a little different than yours. If we let go of the meadow, the I have this all figured out, as you can open yourself up to more, what part of this tradition moves you? What creates a sense of more than physical? Is it the music on a Sunday morning? Does it for me, that last one in the swell? Holy crap. A funeral. Doing something for another human being. Looking at somebody you love in the eyes and going, I see you and you see me. Is it conceiving of the world through a plan, a divine plan where everything's figured out and nothing is by chance? Does that work for you? Great. There's as many trampolines on the ledge as there are people. And we've got a few spares, actually. I like to change out my trampoline now and again. <laughs> I always say there's a conception of God for every moment. So sometimes when I'm feeling really hopeless and powerless, I switch over to the super being trampoline and I'm like, oh yeah, this one feels good now. What if we used our experience, something's ability to create ecstasis? What if we use bounce to determine which conception of God we need in any given moment? If you let your heart open to that. And isn't it interesting? I was thinking about this the other day. When I'm on the trampoline, my body's never like this. It always feels open. It feels like my heart's open. Like something's moving me. What is it that does that for you? My prayer, our prayer, I'm going to speak for Jeff, our prayer today is that you open yourself up to that. You open yourself up to the conceptions of God, conceptions, plural, that create ecstasis for you. You don't fall into the pattern of going, oh, no, 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 this one's the right one. You all got it wrong. No, no, no. <laughs> That's Meadowland. That's just creating a new meadow. We could have done that, created a new meadow at Friend Church. It would have been easier. Instead, what we did is we said, no, no, no. We're going to create a space for everyone's trampoline. And I want to invite you all to bounce. As you go from here today, have that feeling, that mindset bounce. Watch for it. As you're walking in the park, is it there? Having a great meal there? Where do you find that? And my encouragement is hold on to it deeply. Bring it back to Friend Church and share it with the rest of us. We exist to inspire you to a spirituality, your spirituality, that impacts the world around you. We don't know what it looks like, but that's our goal. Amen.